thank, thank you. you. So, so welcome, welcome everybody. everybody. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. For I know this is uh, one, one of the coveted time slots of morning of the last day. day. So, so appreciate you being here with me. Uh, so yeah, so, yes, Scott Lecker. I'm a civil engineer uh, by training, uh, PE in Indiana. Uh, my current title is VDC Systems Lead, uh, which is kind of nebulous. Uh, I like to tell people that the niche that I occupy is learning from and interacting with a lot of our BIM experts on the vertical industry and finding ways that we can take those best practices and terminology and apply it to BIM for infrastructure. Um, so my background, the uh, first part of my career was uh, fairly traditional, 15 years of design and plant production in PSME, uh, mostly for added capacity projects. And then in the last six years or so, more of a technology focus, uh, a little bit of a career pivot. Uh, so again, focusing on, on VDC and uh, BIM for infrastructure. Uh, so the overview of uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, first of all, just talk, talk about what I mean by demystifying it, uh, get into the dictionary a little bit. Uh, and, and then talk, talk through some foundational concepts and definitions that we like to use. Uh, talk, talk through what Open BIM is. Uh, hopefully, uh, make some connections as to each of us individually why, why you should care. Uh, and then ultimately, the crux of the presentation is to, uh, to try to help all of us wrap our head around this. Um, and then finally, finish with, uh, with what comes next. So. As, As I, said, I said, starting from the dictionary, dictionary uh, mystify uh, means, means to perplex the mind of or bewilder, uh, uh, or secondly, to make mysterious or obscure. And, and I think the second, second definition uh, is probably where uh, we, we would have most of uh, the connections between this concept of open BIM and uh, general industry at the current point in time. So, so trying to avoid this, this situation, situation right? Uh, mind blown with heads exploding and such. And uh, I specifically titled this uh, for the highway and bridge practitioners because that's the, that's the universe that I come from uh, in terms of my background. And so uh, focused primarily on design and project delivery, uh, not because of BIM doesn't apply to all the other parts of the asset life cycle, but uh, it's just easiest for me to sort of draw these connections that we'll be talking about. Okay, so um, in, in my little corner of the world, uh, in terms of BIM, we like to make the uh, distinction that BIM used by itself is more of a verb. This is more of talking about the processes and the workflows. And, and then the BIM model itself is more of a noun. So I guess if you expanded the acronym, that would maybe get uh, a little bit into the Department of Redundancy Department. Um, but that's the way that... Uh, that's the way that I like to refer to these concepts. And then in terms of uh, talking with folks uh, coming from the traditional 2D bad, uh, background and just starting to wrap their heads around them, I like to say that uh, you can think of it as parametric geometry plus metadata or property sets. Uh, so in this example here, you can see we've got uh, some 3D corridor models and bridges, and we've got the metadata and property sets as well as down at the bottom here, we've got some parametric geometry. Uh, in this case, some of the dimensions and, and rules for resizing this uh, substructure component and the pier and uh, whatnot. So, foundation of Open BIM uh, is Industry Foundation Classes, or IFC. And uh, this is our standardized digital open format, multiple use cases, and, uh, and it's international. So the example that I have here is a storm sewer network, um, a project that we were involved with, and specifically focused on the design to construction and the design to asset management use case. Uh, and in this particular situation, this was a case where uh, there were multiple designers and multiple consultants all contributing to a single uh, construction contract. And, uh, and uh, of, of course, course as, as, as is often the case, at least in my experience, experience you have one consultant focused in one software platform and another consultant focused in a different software, software platform. platform. So, so part of what we did uh, as, as the process, process of data review and data conditioning uh, for ultimate use in asset management and GIS 
was to use some of the uh, IFC capabilities in the various software. So um, here on the left, we've got a desktop viewer. Um, this is the Blender BIM add-in. And then on the right, we've got this same data within the Autodesk uh, Construction Cloud viewer. And uh, probably hard to see, but the, the point here is that the geometry is the same, right? Regardless of viewer, you've got the same metadata, um, and you have the flexibility to use uh, your tool of choice, you know, what you're comfortable with or uh, what, you, what you've used the most. OK, so digging into some principles of OpenVim, Interoperability, like I just said, multiple software platforms, uh, openness, and, and for me, uh, one of the biggest uh, characteristics of openness is being able to open an IFC model in any type of text editor, right? Uh, VS Code in this case, or Notepad, or whatever. So it's, it's not just a black box of a, a bunch of binary data, but it's something you can actually get in and look at to see and understand how the data is being encoded. Uh, and, and because it's open, then it's reliable, uh, fosters collaboration, gives you the flexibility to use the tool of choice, and then ultimately it's more sustainable, right? Because you're not locking your data into one certain vendor that may uh, completely change the software in the future, or maybe even go out of business or be acquired, or uh, all the things that, that tend to happen over the technology lifespan. OK, so try to make the case for, for why uh, each of you in the audience, why should, why should you care? Um, and maybe the, the first item, uh, the easiest to go to, there's the ASHTO resolution from 2019. Uh, stating IFC is the standard data schema for the exchange of electronic engineering data. Uh, but I think, in, in my mind, maybe a stronger a stronger reason is that the world is already open. So this is where we get into audience participation. Uh, so by a show of hands, how many people here have already opened or will open at some point today a web browser? OK, good. <laughs> how about um, are you doing that on a laptop? Are you doing it on a phone? Are you doing it on a mobile device, like a tablet? Are you using Windows? Are you using uh, iOS, Android? Right? right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. Right? right. The, the, the internet, internet is the internet, internet. and because, because it's, it's based, based on all these open standards, uh, TCP, IP, and HTML, HTML, and so on, it doesn't it matter. matter. You can use the tool of choice, and uh, we, can we can communicate and collaborate without having to condition the data. Uh, and then also, I guess similarly, has anyone sent an email today? Or do you anticipate sending an email today? Right. Uh, so, do you need to reach out to your recipient ahead of time and say, oh, I see you're using Gmail. Um, I want to send you an email. I'm going to have to export it first so that you can import it and read it into your, it into your browser. No, right. Uh, so ultimately, as I see it, the, the world of the information is already open. And uh, the situation we have now in BIM for infrastructure is more of an outlier uh, in this universe. And so again, to really be really integrated collaborative, uh, we, we need to allow all, all the stakeholders to have that flexibility to use their tool of choice and use the tool that best fits their needs and their use case uh, without uh, locking into a, a specific uh, set of tools. OK, um, and then another illustration here. Um, and I can't take credit for putting this together. This comes from a webinar from the Building Smart U.S. US Airports, Airports Committee. Uh, but, but again, again talking, talking about other parts of our universe in, in design and construction and how, uh, in this case specifically, construction differs from what we see a lot of times in BIM requirements or CAD requirements. So um, the idea in Open BIM is to focus on the data specification and not means and methods of how you generate that data. So uh, the example, the hypothetical example here, uh, let's, let's say, say we're, we're putting out a uh, construction contract, and uh, we're going to have some hardware, right? right? So, so you would never see a specification for common excavation saying, uh, under equipment, all the excavation work must be performed solely with Komatsu equipment, right? Caterpillar is not welcome on this project. 
and uh, hopefully uh, that will come across as a, a little humorous or uh, comical, but uh, the, the point being that uh, we're not dictating means and methods of requiring specific tools or st uh, specific hardware. Okay, so in terms of uh, demystifying OpenVim, uh, my mechanism here is to draw connections between OpenVim and concepts that a lot of us are familiar with from being in the industry, and uh, trying to take things that are well known and then correlate them to OpenVim. So the first uh, connection here is uh, the OpenVim Industry Foundation classes and uh, DXF for CAD files. So the example here is uh, some DXF work that we had used a number of years ago on a visualization project. Uh, but most, most people in industry have encountered this at one point or the other. I like to think of it as the uh, lowest common denominator a lot of times between these various systems. Uh, and as, as a side note, if you want to talk about uh, mining in Google, uh, our son had some algebra homework the other day, uh, and it was adding fractions that were all variables that were all letters. And uh, it was, he was really struggling. Uh, but thinking about and, and trying to impress upon him, well, you, you already know how to do this. And before you add, you need to have a common denominator. Uh, and so there's a, there's a connection here, and, and DXF uh, kind of performs that, but I, I would say it tends more towards the lowest common denominator than a higher common denominator. So some similarities, right? Uh, both IFC and DXF are focused on geometry. Uh, you have the ability to arrange your data into layers uh, that then typically drive your presentation in terms of line styles and colors and, and weights and so on. Uh, and then you have multiple tools like the read and write to the XF, which ultimately is where a lot of the usefulness comes from. Uh, some of the differences is that DXF is really uh, geometry. You don't have the same capabilities for metadata and property sets. Uh, and it's also controlled by a single vendor. So then the next connection is IFC um, being compared to the Venerable Survey of Points file, the ASCII text file. So we've got an example here, uh, fairly common uh, point number, northern easting elevation description uh, type of delimited or, or uh, space delimited file. So again, some, some similarities between IFC and this type of approach. Uh, it's also vendor neutral. Uh, for the most part, and it's also plain text. So you can open it up, look at it, do some visual QC, um, and generally speaking, uh, it is able to move from platform to platform and use case to use case. Uh, some differences is that there's really no enforcement of schema. Uh, a lot of times, at least in my experience, you, you may not even have headers on the data, so you're, you're guessing, uh, right, that what it looks like this is Point number northern easting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it northern easting or is it X Y? Right. And so then you have to import it, and then uh, you know pretty quickly <laughs> if it's uh, if you got it back. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but it, you have a 50 percent chance, right? So it's like half, uh, last half empty. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, but there's no enforcement of the schema, and then like what you're saying. You, you, you can sort of do visual QC, but ultimately it requires some manual steps of inputting into your system, uh, assuming that your system is configured correctly to read it, and then visual review and, and working through that. So uh, that can take a lot of time, right? And uh, a number of agencies that we've talked with have uh, expressed concerns or, or difficulties around how to, how to staff and how to, uh, how to handle that QC, right? As, as survey data is coming in from multiple different parties for multiple different projects, that, uh, that becomes uh, unsustainable and can be a bottleneck. Thank you for that little <laughs> All right, so yeah, so connection number three, IFC and land XML. So uh, in my perspective, this is probably the closest thing that we currently have uh, in terms of drawing connections to things currently in the, in the industry to uh, some of the open BIM concept. So we have an example here. I think this is some alignment data. Yes. Uh, so 
it, it um, uh, get click happy. happy. Let's come back here. So again, vendor neutral, neutral format, format, plain text, uh, in wide use, use and uh, can, can also be very, very useful. Uh, and uh, tends to get a lot of use, again, so that we're not uh, only opening and using data in a, a single platform. Uh, so some of the differences here is that XML tends to be more US focused. Uh, it's not an ISO standard like uh, IFC. Uh, it's also very stagnant uh, and minimal active development. So uh, it, it's good and, and it uh, performs the use, but not necessarily continuing to advance and adapt to new uh, technology concepts and platforms. OK, so thus far we've been focused a lot on data. Let's start to talk about workflow. Um, so on the open BIM side, we have this concept of BIM collaboration format, or BCF. And this is an open method that enables open communication to identify and exchange model-based issues. So this is uh, in review and, and uh, QC checking. So in our example here, this is an issue where uh, it, it appears that the column location as model does not line up with the column location as it's shown on the plans. Uh, and so you can see there's a, a screenshot of this location in the model that captures uh, the camera location and uh, its orientation in terms of what it's looking at. Uh, and then we have the different statuses that we can put. We have timestamps for when it's created and when it is updated. Uh, and you have assignments and, and whatnot. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> so the connection here, uh, in collaboration format, uh, as I see it, is similar to uh, what I would call an issue tracking spreadsheet. Uh, or review comment resolution sheet. So, uh, again, in, in current practice, uh, you'll submit a, a deliverable. Uh, typically, plans may be plans with digital information as well. Someone will review it and then create a list of comments. And so, we've got a cross reference to who created the comment, uh, what plan sheet or what part of the model it refers to, what the comment is, uh, and then the code and the response and who it is assigned. So, so, again, a uh, uh, lot of similarities here. here. It's a list, list of issues with status of each issue and assignments of each issue, uh, and, and it's used for collaboration and review around these information exchanges. Uh, differences, differences is that the spreadsheet is text only, so, so it's not, not graphically tied to the plan and the model, model, other than potentially a, a plan sheet or maybe a file. Uh, and then and also what I've seen, uh, one of the one of the landmines is that uh, the, the specific format of these spreadsheets tends to vary from project to project, or client to client, and uh, it can potentially get broken uh, by that user right, if you're not careful about interacting with it and if you don't have uh, a lot of protection built into the spreadsheets. Okay, so now moving on a little bit deeper into model checking and quality control. So in so OpenVim, we have uh, this concept of information delivery specification, or IDS. Uh, and, and this is a machine-readable specification to define these requirements of the exchange. So uh, again, yeah, hard to read here, but this, this example is, is uh, an IDS file that we built uh, by hand. Uh, it's fairly simple, uh, but it's for an airport project where we're managing all of these subsurface utility models. And uh, as you might suspect, uh, one of the very important pieces of metadata that we want to assign to each part of the utility model is the subsurface utility engineering uh, or the SU quality level, right? A, B, C, or D. Uh, so fairly straightforward uh, in terms of practitioner knowledge and experience. So what we put together in this file is uh, a requirement that every, every structure and every pipe needs to have a property set for SU quality level. And it needs to be filled out, and it needs to be either A, B, C, or D. Uh, and, and this is something that I've been checking for a while and using a couple of different sources. Uh, I think initially we did it in Navis Works with some selection sets and properties. Uh, the thing that really applies to me, or the, the thing that really appeals to me here is that you can build out these rules and requirements once and use it on any project regardless of what uh, 
piece of software, offering software is being used. Um, and again, coming back to the airport example, we've got uh, a, an awful lot of the VIM work happening in Revit, uh, as well as the utility modeling and site work that's happening in Civil 3D. So, um, you know, there are QC checking tools in both of those platforms, but by standardizing the IIC as a common representation of all of that data, then we can build these types of, of checks once and then use them across all of the models, regardless of how they were um, So this gets us to the uh, connection number five. So IDS uh, as it's compared to the venerable QC checklist. So similarities is that they're both serving the same contractual purpose, right? We're, uh, we're, we're verifying the quality and the correctness of the data that's being exchanged. And they're also customizable, right? You can start with a template and then make it more and more specific and customized to your uh, use case on, on your project or potentially your uh, specific agency standard. Uh, the difference again here is that uh, IDS processes are uh, automated and the QC checklist is very manual, so it involves a lot of time and is prone to uh, human error. Uh, another difference is that IDS can integrate with additional sources of standardization, such as the Building Smart Data Dictionary. And so, you know, that, that could be any number of things in the Data Dictionary. Maybe that's the library of applicable page item names, numbers, and, and units, and so on. So that gets us to our last major connection. And, and this is where I start to change uh, and maybe get more into uh, aspirational phase of, uh, of where I see things heading and, and ultimately uh, what I think uh, the, the vision is for, for where we're going. Uh, so comparing IFC to uh, PDFs. Again, similarities here, uh, at least on the PDF side, it tends to be the de facto way of delivering our plans. Uh, and aspirationally, I would like to ultimately see IFC be that uh, de facto way of delivering engineering data. Uh, I think generally speaking, most users and agencies feel comfortable with uh, long-term archive PDF. Uh, both PDF and IFC are both nicer standard, and therefore you know, multiple tools can read and write. Uh, some differences on the PDF side is that it tends to be uh, sheet coordinates only. Right? So, uh, a PDF document is, is sort of describing how to paint things on a sheet uh, as opposed to being focused primarily on model geometry and uh, uh, scale orientation and, and so on. Uh, and then you have property set information metadata, but it's not specifically tied to the associated geometry, right? Maybe a piece of text in a table or uh, on a meter or something like that. Uh, and again, kind of a, a common theme on the PDF side is that you you have manual QC processes, which can be very lengthy, take a lot of time, uh, require a lot of staffing, and potentially reduce the human error. OK, so wrapping up, hopefully uh, I've uh, uh, struck some chords or made some connections between Open BIM and sort of state of, uh, state of the practice currently. Uh, we'll talk through uh, foundational, foundational concepts about what open BIM is. Hopefully, I've convinced folks that they should at least uh, be somewhat interested uh, in these topics. Uh, we made the connections to help wrap, uh, wrap our heads around all of this. And so, to, to wrap up. A little click happy again. Uh, so, as I see it, I think. There's the perception that we're at a little bit of a chicken or an egg uh, situation, uh, right? That software vendors are saying that they need more information and more standards before they can build a product, but uh, we can't, uh, we think that we can't generate IFC models until we have all those standards, everything fleshed out perfectly so that the vendors can create the tools to be able to write it the way that we need it or that we need. Uh, and, and that also, also heard a lot of, you know, this is in the future, future way out of the future, or near future, future and uh, it's not, not quite, quite ready yet. yet. 
think I would challenge people that, uh, that it is ready. And the way that we're going to get there and get there more quickly is to actually start using it and um, dig into it and see where the gaps actually are and see what actually works in practice um, and uh, kind of tailor the standards and requirements to what actually provides value. Um, and kind of along with that, you know, the seeing and believing. Uh, a lot of folks I work with are, are based out of our Kansas City office, and so I constantly hear about uh, them being in the show real estate, right? Like you can uh, explain something, but uh, if you can actually show what it looks like, uh, then that helps go a long way towards uh, validating an idea or validating the process. So again, let's, let's push forward and, and try to get these examples out of the wild of, of projects that are currently being designed and delivered, or maybe have already been constructed and are moving into um, asset management and operations. Um, and ultimately, uh, this last bullet might be more for myself, <laughs> individual than, than the audience. I think I, a lot of times I'll, I will uh, uh, try, to, try to get something perfect uh, before releasing it or before letting go of it. But uh, a lot of times there's a lot of value in getting to something that's good enough versus all the extra effort to get it from good enough to uh, a supposed idea of perfection. So with that, open for questions, comments, additional discussion. One question and a ton of comments. Okay. <laughs> the question you said, IDS file format, which is really new to me, you said it's machine readable. Mm -hmm. How do the products, do they read that file in and use it as a rule digit? Yes, it can be done. Yeah. 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 So, so, yeah, so it, the, 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 the format of the IDS, IDS in terms of how you encode those rules, rules I think is, is still um, in draft or close to final draft version. Um, so it's, it's new, I think it's fairly limited in terms of commercial software right now today that they could go and, and buy to both create the rule sets as well as uh, you know, a rule check. Uh, I think that uh, Solibri in particular is one of the common platforms that's maybe furthest out on that edge, given that um, you know, they have a lot of market share and reputation around being a, a, a QC checking or a rule checking engine. Solibri, S-O-L-I-B-R-I. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a, uh, you can get a, a free, uh, kind of a, trial version that, that gives you X amount of functionality and then paid version provides everything else. But uh, yeah, I've used it in the past and, and uh, you, you, can, you can do a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things with, uh, without having to, to shell out for a full commercial license. work for us, it has to accommodate these open interfaces. Um, and I think that's maybe where I would lean towards is uh, 
you know, we, we, we can still use the Bentley Cloud or the Autodesk Cloud or the Esri Cloud, but it needs to support the interface, um, like the, the OpenCD or the, the BCF um, API, so that, again, you have the ability to retain ownership over your data, and if 5, 10, 20 years down the road, you want to make that migration, that, that you can do so. But, yeah, not a... Not, a, not an easy uh, yeah, nut to crack. I was just mentioning that last year, I did some migration. We were talking with a couple of Esri folks, and again, it wasn't the research and Delta Bell was the focus, but it really didn't seem like it was going much anywhere, but I think you can see it's getting that turn. With the big project coming up, the 23 version, it looks like they put a lot of effort into the migration. Mm -hmm. So, so, I guess maybe, maybe I, I would, I'd be interested in hearing thoughts from the room. One of the things I've heard, uh, I think I've heard from a number of agencies is, is again, kind of getting back to my point, like, yeah, theoretically, IFC sounds great and sounds exactly where we would go, but I haven't actually seen it in practice yet. What does it, what does it look like, feel like, smell like, taste like? So my, my, my answer, answer is, is that IFC is more of a data format or a schema. schema. API is the way that different software packages can talk to each other to exchange that data. No, no.
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it will be backwards compatible for as long as we can. Exactly. exactly. Right. So, so that would yes. be another fault. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's, that's exactly, exactly right. right. And that's, that's, that's part, part of the, the, the last connection I was trying to make, right? right? So, so you hear about PDF A uh, for archive. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, I see a very similar thing with IFC. Um, not, not to be necessarily, necessarily need a, another acronym, acronym to add a dash A to it, but you're exactly right. right. Like, like, um, you, you develop all of that data now, and then 20 or 30 or 50 years down the road, you, tools, tools are still around that can read and write and understand that data, yeah. because, because it's, it's not, not, a, it's, it's it's not any one vendor's special sauce. sauce. So it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me add to that story. Um, if you go out to the Autodesk Cloud, it used to be they would only support three ver two versions back in the church. So if you had a three-year-old file and you published it up there, it would say the cloud. And that's just three years. Yeah. Yeah. So right. it's no longer that's valid. That's another reason as we push toward a better information management view of BIM, mm -hmm. I think BIM is the largest modeling part in, in my view. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. More yeah. open mm -hmm. and durable and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So great presentation. I hope yeah. that added to I, I have some more. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so okay. Yeah, we yeah, have some time. Yeah. What, 15, 20 minutes. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so uh, another, another thing, thing just came, came to me in terms of, of the open API. API. Uh, uh, so, so one, one of the standards that's out in the wild. Uh, and again, again not, not specific, specific to BIM or engineering, but for uh, all types of data, is um, the O data specification. And this is a uh, this is a, a vendor neutral and open API that um, allows different systems to make queries against a database in a common way. Um, so, like uh, in, in the past, if you had a SQL database and you were putting in Select star from this table where, uh, you know, condition one, condition two, condition three. So uh, let's make a concrete example. So let's say we had a, a table of uh, pay items and quantities for a bit of a particular project. So maybe we want to say select everything in this table where uh, the specification section is 203. Uh, so that is the query that goes to the database and then returns all of the data uh, in the Tabular format. So, so the OData data specification, specification for an API is, is very similar. Uh, so, so it's a, a web system. system. So you're making <laughs> making a query to a web address, and then, and then you're providing the same parameters. So, so you can say uh, return all of the. And, and actually, Bentley, Bentley supports this. this. Uh, I just, just in the last couple of weeks got into this with their project-wise project web service gateway. So if you want to make a query against project-wise to return a list of folders or return a list of repositories or a list of files that are written. Uh, you use the OData specification. And so make the query, make the, uh, the get request to the repository ID, and then uh, you can say uh, return every return all of the documents where the folder number is 032891 or something like that. So, uh, so, so there are examples and, and even from the specific vendors that have done that already. Uh, I think maybe coming back to the other question, ultimately the, the software vendors will build what their customers ask for. So uh, if, if there's consensus and clarity on this is exactly what we want, uh, I'd like to think that, that they will ultimately implement that and support that. Yeah. You know, what what happens there in some of those nuances? We see it that it can be really really good at moving between the phases of the life cycle. But you know there had been talk before about oh you'll be able to do this in this design tool and then go over this design tool mm -hmm. and back here and back there and you know IFC loses the design intent. You've got great information about the geometry, but if I had you know rules about intersection angles or whatever, 
-hmm. that goes out the door. And uh -huh. so you, you don't have that whole flow of information, but there is key, the flow of key information that you need to go from design to bid or bid and yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So, 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 so two comments. comments. Uh, uh, US, US survey fee, fee is absolutely supported. supported. Uh, so, so the unit definition in IFC, as you might suspect, starts from SI, right? Uh, but you can very easily define a custom unit, and then you just relate it back to the SI equivalent. So uh, international foot versus survey foot is just a matter of, you know, the, the, the number of what, exactly 0.3048 as opposed to 0.3048 out to infinity. So yeah, so, so that um, shouldn't be an issue. Um, then, um, then the, the second, second part, part on the projection, projection um, originally, originally it was limited to EPSG codes, codes right? right? So, so it needed to be something that was published. published. Um, one, one of the very recent changes, changes I think like even as part of uh, ISO, ISO feedback, feedback and comment, is, is that, that there's, there's now a mechanism to encode a well-known text string. string. Uh, uh, so yeah, so if you, you have a custom projection, then rather than referring to an EPSG code, then you encode a well-known text. And then and that then provides all the information for every other system to reproject accurately. Yeah, and, and those kind of, like I said, I get out of the, the technical yeah, yeah, yeah. real quick, but if you get into those kind of nuanced things, then you lose some of that compatibility or free flow between yes. everything. Yeah, right now, we're, we're not there. Uh, 4.3 is my understanding is at 5, and that would be more of the international scale than being transparent or whatever. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Let, let, let the vendors compete on the capabilities of their individual platforms and, and not who has, the, who has the biggest market share. All right. My watch says we still have 15 minutes until break, but we can leave early for a break. Or I, I can chat all day long. I tell people I can, I, I can talk about IFC for days and weeks. You're a little bit more, I retired in May, so I haven't really followed this. Not, not, not in my, no. Okay, so then I, now I can go back up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 we're all the real world. <laughs> I, I, would I would say, say so, 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 so this, this is, is let me maybe, maybe step, step back, back and be very clear that this is my personal, personal opinion, opinion um, that, that there's, there's nothing, nothing broken, broken with alignment in IFC 4.3. It's, it's maybe, maybe a, a bit, bit more, more complex, complex and obtuse than it could have been. Well, didn't they change the land XML and the prototype format and the order? I think, I think so. so. I, 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 I don't, don't know. know. Okay. Because I'm familiar with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 All right. Well, thanks, thanks everyone, everyone for. Uh, for hanging out and for not throwing things <laughs> for the for the good conversation. Appreciate it. I would like to see this next year in Iowa, but actually the demonstration you talked about showing. Yeah. That sells.